Good morning, Breakfast Clubbers. I want to let you know that I've invited an amazing speaker with us today. Christopher Weissman is our club secretary, but he's also an amazing traveler who loves to go out around the world. And instead of being locked in, we're going to travel the world through Christopher's eyes today. Christopher Wiseman. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Tony. Um, and thank you everyone for having me. Today is a special day actually for this presentation because it's two years to the day when I left to go on this trip. So it is an anniversary um, and I'm gonna start with some photos. So this trip came about because I received several invitations. Um, I was invited to Glyndebourne Opera Festival in early July. Then I was invited to run a race in Paris uh, in August. And then I won tickets to go to Bayreuth. And when I say won, I don't mean free. I won the lottery to purchase tickets. And so I had all these trips planned. And I thought, how am I going to do this? And it just seemed crazy going to Europe three times in one summer. And the environmental impact was going to be high for this much traveling. The cost was going to be high. And I was sort of just looking for a change in my life. And it's something that I'd always wanted to do. I never traveled this way before. So I was learning on the fly, so to speak. Um, but I had thoughts that there would be delicious food along the way. And just so all of you know, these are all pictures from my trip. They're pictures I took myself. They're not photos that I found from Google Images. So I knew there was food to try, new friends to meet, and beautiful places to see that I couldn't even plan. Um, but you have to make a plan. And I've always been an event planner. So for me, I needed to have some structure. So I basically became married to a calendar as well as a map of Europe for six months. And I started with a much bigger plan. Some places did not make the final cut. I'm sure we've all had a trip where you just have not been able to do everything you wanted to do on one trip. And that was the case. Um, one of the places, uh, funnily, was um, San Marino, Italy. Or it's not Italy, but it's within Italy. It's its own country. It was going to take me a whole day to get there and a whole day to leave for an eight-hour trip, essentially. So I decided, you know, some places are meant for the future, and that was one of them. A few others did not make the cut as well. But, you know, once I got there, I added a few spots as well. Um, there was some time where I had free time. I wanted to stay longer in one place or if a place wasn't um, needing more time for explanation or exploration, I could just leave. Um, so this is one of the beautiful spots I saw. This is in uh, Kosovo. Uh, that was one of the spots I went probably in September. So it was later on in the trip. And sometimes I would just sit on a bench and see something beautiful. And I hope you'll see that through the photos. Um, to start with the trip, I had to pack. This is the first time I've done such a detailed packing list for myself. Things got cut from the list. Things got added. The little backpack I had was almost empty. The only things that I kept in it were my passport, uh, a little bit of cash, and then the food I'd be eating within the next 24 hours, and a bottle of water. And of course, my chargers for my devices. And then that was my little suitcase. But I thought I would start with a fun story about my tuxedo, since that was one of the teasers for joining this. So Lineborn in uh, England, it's right outside of London, uh, everyone wears a tuxedo. It's like you uh, tuxedo and picnic, and then you enjoy the opera. There's long intermissions, so people really dress up. And then in Bayreuth, people really dress up, and you wear a tuxedo every night. But these were, I think they were about six weeks apart, and I did not want to carry around a tuxedo. So after I went to Glyndebourne, I didn't have time to go to the post office. So when I got to Finland, 
I mailed the tuxedo to my friend in Germany who brought me the tuxedo in Bayreuth. And then in Bayreuth, someone I met once took the tuxedo back to San Francisco for me. So my tuxedo sort of traveled around the world too. It had its own adventures without me, which is fun. But sometimes you have something that you want for part of a trip, but not the entire trip. And that was the tuxedo. Um, anytime I wanted to buy something or a new pair, a pair of pants or clothes, something had to go. Uh, this blazer that I'm wearing actually came from the trip. I bought this in um, Macedonia, in Skopje. Um, I wasn't planning to buy this, but I ended up getting invited to Opera Bastille in Paris, which was the last night of my trip. And I needed something a little bit nicer to wear, so I bought a blazer. Um, I went to a lot of places I knew very little about. Um, so this spot is actually Albania. I did not have a lot of time to spend in Albania. I was in the northern part. Uh, beautiful, a lot of Italian influence, uh, lovely place to, to explore and really meet people. Um, this is me. Um, crazy is good. Um, so sometimes when you travel, you really just need to be open to what the world um, is offering you. And I met these uh, wonderful friends in Romania and they're wearing these shirts that said bananas and uh, they gave me one. So this is something that came with me on the trip. And how often can you say you were in a bar in Bucharest? Uh, I think they were like professional models and um, they were buying me drinks and listening to my story and then they gave me a shirt. And um, this is in uh, Dubrovnik, Croatia. Um, it's up on a hill. Um, I was on a budget, but sometimes when you're on a budget, you need to splurge a little bit. So this is sushi in uh, Belgrade, a uh, beautiful city and very cosmopolitan, something I knew very little about uh, with Belgrade. Um, this is a new friend and me and my tuxedo at the uh, Bayreuth Festival. So a little bit about Bayreuth, even if you don't like opera, if you like to drink or socialize, it's a really great place to be, something I didn't know. They have about four hours of intermissions every day so one day I was um, Skyping with a friend in the US. They said, oh yeah, I'm getting ready to go to the opera. He said, is it a matinee? And I said, no, but everyone gets there like at two and then you drink until about 4.30 and then you have long intermissions. So I met a lot of really nice uh, German people as well. And that was my friend Joel, a uh, really nice guy. He goes there every year, like a lot of the people. Um, sometimes you see the unexpected. Uh, this is an art wall. I saw this is on a little island in uh, Croatia called Havar. And I was just walking down an alley and it was very uh, interesting to see these shoes actually glued to a wall. Definitely something I wasn't expecting, but a really interesting art piece. And I saw interesting art everywhere. And I'll, oftentimes I'll go to a trip to go to a museum or to see a famous piece. But on this trip, I didn't go to a lot of museums. I went to a few but I was just seeing the art that I could see on the street. And I try to do that when I'm in San Francisco as well. Um, this was fun. Um, things do go wrong on a trip. So I had planned to go to Lake Bled in Slovenia. I think it was a monsoon. Um, Tony would know that he's from Georgia, but it was that type of rain. It was just raining really hard. And my friend in San Francisco, Peter, made me take this poncho with me. He's like, you're gonna need it. And I said, it's summer, I don't think I will. Um, the trip was three months long. It was uh, July to October. So I thought, well, maybe I might need it later on in the trip. And it poured, and I was so happy to have this poncho. Um, I ended up walking around the whole lake. I had cake. Um, I found the only other two visitors at Lake Bled to take my photo. If you've not been to Lake Bled, it's a beautiful spot. Um, my next photo was interesting. So I stayed in a lot of apartments like this. Uh, another teaser that I mentioned in the trip summary was my budget. Um, I'm a very frugal person with a lot of things and I did not want to spend more than $8,000. And I did a budget just like I would for anything and I couldn't get the numbers to work. So the only way to get the numbers to work is if I cut housing a lot. So when I was in a lot of Eastern European countries, I stayed in um, 
apartments. I met wonderful families. A lot of times they would cook meals for me. They always did my laundry. I think because they'd had Americans stay with them before who don't know how to use laundry machines. I think they'd rather just them do it than me break something. So their mistake was my benefit. And I experienced a lot of that. Um, this was an interesting building. This was in Moldova. Um, I met the most wonderful woman. Uh, she was Russian and I think she just wanted to like cook for me the whole time. I ended up not doing a lot of things I wanted to in Moldova just because I liked hanging out with her and listening to her life stories. Sometimes just meeting people and listening to them was pretty relaxing. Um, I would eat a lot of bread. I was seeking the world's best bread. Sometimes I would be in a place where they didn't understand English, but they understood I was hungry and would just give me what they thought I should have at that time. Uh, so this was in Banja Luka. Uh, it's sort of its own country. It's part of Bosnia and Herzegovina, but if you look closely, it's part of Sripska. It has its own government. It's a capital. And this is their traditional breakfast, the yogurt and this uh, type of bread. Uh, it's filled with spinach. It's very good. It's very filling. I still remember that dish. And I think I was full all day after that. Um, that was me. Um, I did a lot of races. I'm an active runner. And what's great about running is I always meet people in the running community. And I really wanted this photo here because I had a really special experience. I ran the Sarajevo half marathon. And when I checked in, I was being all crazy, like you can see in the photo. And I was doing a lot of this. And I lost my race bid number. And if you've ever done a sporting event, these race numbers are very important. So the next day I go to the race and I was all prepared to tell a sad story. There could have been tears. I was prepared to just share my sadness. I go up to them and I say, hello, I'm Christopher Wiseman. And I say, wait. And then they bring a box of chocolates for me. And they said, you must have been so worried. We found your race number yesterday. Are you okay? And they were just so nice about it. And they made it seem like it was their fault that I was acting all crazy and lost my race number but someone turned it in, they got it to me. I had a wonderful race, uh, really nice people in um, Sarajevo. Beautiful city as well. Um, if you have not been, it's a city and part of it feels Turkish and part of it feels like you're in Vienna and it changes with one block in the street. So it's like you're walking and then it's a distinct change in how the city looks. Very interesting uh, place and lovely people. Um, some more friends that I met, um, they were from Belgium. Um, I went uh, to Plitvis Lakes in Croatia. Beautiful place, it's all these lakes. I went hiking, I went by myself, obviously, so I was doing this as a solo trip, but I met them, we hiked together, we had fun, and I visited Plitvis Lakes, another great place, probably the most beautiful park I went on the entire trip. Another way I kept my cost down is I visited a lot of natural parks and outdoor activities. This was one of the more expensive ones. And it was interesting. I didn't want to stay overnight there. So I took the morning bus from Zegrab. I left at 4 a.m. I got to the park when it opened. I checked my bag. I went hiking all day. And then I got on another bus to take me to the next city, which was Split, Croatia. Um, so it's kind of an interesting trip, sort of a whirlwind, and I was really nervous about checking the bags here. This was one of the things I didn't know. As much research as you do in advance, I was like, what do I do with those bags? But of course, it all worked out. Um, almost everything worked out on the trip. I made a couple mistakes myself, but it happens. I booked a flight for the wrong day. Like, I booked it in for June instead of July when I needed it. And at the airport, they made it seem like it was their fault. They even refunded me the ticket. Um, so you would just meet really kind people. And I never got mad or stressed out because um, oftentimes it was my mistake. Another beautiful spot. Um, this was something I added. I went to a beautiful island off of Split and just went hiking here all day. Um, a lot of places were really quiet, which was nice. 
This also helped me keep, stay in budget. I love kebabs. So if you like a really inexpensive food when you travel, um, kebabs is a great way. It had protein, it had vegetables, it had bread, and was usually under $2. So often this would be like my meal, and it would fill me up. Um, so there's a couple pieces of fruit, and I was good. I don't know how healthy it is, but whatever it lacked in nutrition, it added in deliciousness. Um, so I definitely experienced a lot of, of, of kebab, and every country had them. Um, my favorite is probably in Germany. Um, I wouldn't tell the people that in the other countries I visited because they were all delicious. And if you really want to make a good first impression on a trip to a new country, I have learned this. All you have to do is say, I heard you have the world's best bread. That's why I'm here. And everyone be like, yeah, of course we have the world's best bread. It took you long enough to get here, but here's an example of it. So if you just want to just make a great first impression, just start with that compliment. So as I've learned, everyone in the world thinks they have the world's best bread. Even in San Francisco, like you go to Tartini, say, I hear you have the world's best bread. Yeah, they're like, yeah, of course we do. And a lot of bakeries think that. Um, another fun story, um, this was my train broke down. I was going between Belgrade and Puerto Rico, uh, Montenegro. Um, I don't know if it really broke down or if they just wanted a, a long smoke break because it seemed like that. Um, and it stopped in from this beautiful monastery and they actually gave us uh, pastry and they were just lovely people. Um, very nice. I mean, I wasn't expecting on the trip, and I'm glad we got to stop, but another beautiful spot. Um, here's another photo of Plitvis Lakes. Uh, this was on the trail. This is one of the lakes. Um, just being open to the world and possibilities. Another fun story is when I was going between Albania and Kosovo, I wasn't exactly sure how to get there, but I purposely stayed in a hotel in Albania so they would help me. And they said I needed to take two buses and then I would be there. It was actually two buses, a van, and a change on a freeway. So it would be like getting dropped off on the 101 and then having to go to the 380, like walking with luggage at 6.30 in the morning. And so I was the only one who got off the bus. Well, these two other guys had got off before me. And then I got off. And I was kind of looking around and then I just followed them and thought, well, maybe they're going to the same place. So I did. And I think they could tell I was nervous. So they ended up giving me a pastry and a bottle of water just to like calm my nerves. And then when I got on the bus, I didn't have enough money and the currency left. And the guys ended up just paying for um, my bus fare. It was like a dollar, but it was still really nice of them. They didn't even know me and they'd already given me breakfast and bus fare. And then when I got to Kosovo, they dropped me off at a gas station. And I thought, there's no way this is the place where I'm, this is supposed to be one of the most beautiful cities. This can't be it. And then there's a guy like waving me over and he has a red van. And I was like, all right. So I get in the red van and he just drops me off at Prisman. And I guess the bus company organized it so you get dropped off at the gas station so they don't have to go into the city, which is very small streets and we'll take you wherever you need in town, which was wonderful. I had another story about a red van, which I'll share at this time since I don't have a great photo. When I was in Moldova, I wanted you to Transnistria. It's questionable if it's a country or not, but if you go there, they're their own country and you actually get a little uh, piece of paper to let you in. And again, I had to take a red van to get there. I went to the bus station and had to look for the red van to take me to Transnistria. Um, I was really grateful that there's also a Canadian on the van tour. Um, so I was a little bit nervous since no one spoke English. And then we just spent the day in Transnistria walking around together. So yeah, you have to be open sometimes. And it was definitely outside of my uh, normal routine to either uh, wait by the side of the road for a bus after crossing the freeway or by looking for a red van to take me to Transnistria. Um, Another fun race I did, this was in Luxembourg, this was in Lemek. Um, I definitely want to talk about this because I had some friends meet me here, and it was the fanciest race I've ever done. I'm not a fast runner, but people were all along the race route, which was a river, drinking like champagne from real crystal. 
and they had all these race stops with real glassware and beautiful food and this lovely place. And the fun part about this one, this was towards the end of the trip, is right after I finished, I went back to the apartment where I was staying in Ramek, took a shower, and then I was on the train um, and headed to Paris for the opera that I was invited to. Uh, so definitely special. And then Luxembourg, if you buy a pass for public transit, it's good for the whole country. So very economical, and you can just buy it on your phone. Uh, so very advanced system for transit. Um, another fun trip, this is in Bratislava. Um, I'd always heard things about Bratislava not being great or people having weird experiences there. So I went, and what I learned about Bratislava is it's a beautiful city, it's very wealthy, and they have delicious wine. I think Slovakian reds are one of my favorite in the world and always a real treat to have. Um, I would like to go back, and one of the things I, I learned about in Slovakia is every November they have a wine weekend where every winery in Slovakia is open, which is over 100 of them, and you can taste for free. So I thought, I wonder how many I could go to in three days. So I think when you go on a trip, you always think there's another place to go to next. Um, so the trip's coming to an end. Um, I'm at the Opera Bastille. This is a closing, very contemporary stage. Um, I start getting messages on my Instagram um, from clients that I used to work with. And two said, we'd like to talk about a career opportunity. And I'm having so much fun. They're like, when do you come back? So I ended up setting up a couple of things for job opportunities. And this was a little nerve wracking. So sometimes when you're on one adventure, another one will approach. And I ended up coming back from the trip on a Tuesday and had two job offers on Friday. And probably if I waited another week, I would have had a third job offer. So sometimes you just have to take a leap of faith and just go for it and hope things are gonna work out, and it really did in my case. So I was glad I got to the Opera Bastille, but I was really grateful that I would have a job when I came back, which is where I am now. So thank you, I hope you've had fun learning some stories. Um, this is another photo I really liked. This is a very unexpected part of the trip. I ended up going to a honey uh, fair, where you would have the best honey in uh, Montenegro. Um, so they had a lot of honey products. I did buy a few too towards the end of the trip. And I've talked about a lot of places. You may have questions. I've never done this kind of trip before, but I had the best time and I would do anything to do it again. Uh, when I was going through the photos for this presentation, I was really thinking, you know, I could be here right now, um, maybe a little sad, uh, but these are the places I went to, uh, just so you have an idea. Um, it was complex to add. Um, so I'll let you look at the screen. You might want to do like a screenshot of it. If you want to talk to me offline about any of the specific spots I went to, I'd be happy to share. I did not talk about every place I went to. Sort of looking if there's anything that I should really talk about. Um, Belarus, that was a really interesting place. Um, that's the place I got there late because I booked the wrong date. And I stayed in this Airbnb and the people had made so much money renting this room for $10 a night. They had bought two more apartments in Belarus. So they're really learning about capitalism through Airbnb. Nice people. Um, Kiev, the Ukraine, um, beautiful, beautiful place. Um, love the people there. And I would really like to go back and spend more time. And I couldn't get enough churches there. I'm not a very religious person, but the Orthodox churches are just so beautiful on the inside and the exterior. Um, Trois, France, that was interesting. Um, so my friend from San Francisco joined me for two weeks and did a road trip to France. And that was a crossword puzzle clue for him. So he really wanted to go. So I said, okay, let's do this. Um, I think that's pretty much all those that I've talked about everything else I wanted to. So I'll stop sharing my screen and open it up to questions. Um, thank you for that. That was a great presentation. And um, I'm, sh <laughs> I'm sure you could go on and on. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, I, okay, so I'm, I'm curious, you know, because this is a very meaningful trip for you. Um, how has it changed you as a person? Wow, Craig, it's really changed everything. Um, I've become a lot happier person 
become a lot calmer and more just laid back. I was this planner where like, if that I wasn't dotted, I wasn't happy. And then by doing this trip, I just learned to just slow down and relax. And when I looked at the photos, I took a lot of just like flowers for a view from when I was sitting on a bench. And I think it's uh, helped me learn to just appreciate life and slow down a little bit. We have a, we have a question from Janice Lipton. Um, she's asking, how do you choose which cities you're gonna go to? It was hard. So I had these invitations for certain things. So I knew I wanted to be there. Then I prioritized places I had not been to. And I looked at a map and if it was easy to get between a few places, I would just focus on that. Um, one trip, I didn't talk about this. I always wanted to take an overnight bus trip. I've never done that before. So I took the bus between Bucharest to Sofia, Bulgaria. And I like crossed a border at night. I was exhausted when I got to Bulgaria because I was so excited. Uh, but sometimes it's just I wanted an experience and that's what brought me to it. Thank you. Um, Susan Rowan's joined us as well. Hi, Susan. Um, her question is, did you see any historic synagogues in Eastern Europe? Um, I did. I saw uh, some beautiful ones um, throughout the trip, actually. Um, I think though the Orthodox churches were the more interesting pieces of architecture that I saw. Um, I did see a couple uh, synagogues in Germany, actually, um, when I was at the Bayreuth Opera Festival as well, that were quite beautiful. Um, some are no longer synagogues, though, and they become cultural centers. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, Patricia, I think you had a question? No? Okay. Um, I'm just looking at the group chat, and I we don't have any other questions here. Um, I, Tony? I would like to make a comment. Yes. It's so impressive. I've traveled a lot alone. However, I am very nervous traveling alone in places that they don't speak English. Uh, so oh. thumbs up to Christopher for being so adventurous. Yeah, most people speak the language of food, which I also speak really well. So that helped. I think that's the universal language. And a lot of people spoke some English. There were very few times where there was none. And I got a Google plan, which was the best thing I ever got. So if I was really lost, I could always translate, I am hungry on my phone in that language. And they're like, okay, we'll take care of it. And no one even took advantage of me. It'd be like, yeah, that's like 10 cents. And okay. Um, it was great. Um, I took some interesting subways and public transit experiences. Uh, probably the weirdest was in um, Belarus um, because you have to buy a token and the woman was like smoking inside and I think she was annoyed with me for buying two and needing change um, but she was fine. You know, just by one at a time and that exact change. Uh, Marty has a question. Um, Marty, are you there? Maybe you can ask this. Sorry, Marty, you're on mute. Yeah. Since Marty's the Russian linguist in the group. There was, I can't get off mute. There I am. No. There you go. Is, is the Transnistria Russian speaking? I understand they actually applied to be part of Russia, but were turned down. Yeah, it's not going to work. So they speak a dialect of Romanian there in Transnistria. Okay. So it's surrounded by Romania and Moldova. Moldova also speaks a dialect of Romanian, but they'll be like, it's completely different, but it's pretty similar. Um, yeah, interesting place. This guy sold me really nice postcards there, but other than that, it was like going back to the 80s. Yep. Yeah. Interesting place. I have a question. Yeah. yeah Good. Uh, Christopher, thank you for sharing that, and the slides are fabulous. I, I've been to many of those countries and to that beautiful, the park in uh, Croatia, yeah. and up in Montenegro, and so mm -hmm. forth. It's it just, it's just, I loved that trip. I was with OAT, Overseas Adventure Travel, so we were not as adventuresome as you, and it was also in the 90s, so better it rained at Split than, or on, on the, um, um, where the island is, the lake you walked around. So where would you go next? Um, would you go back to Croatia or any of these or some other countries? In fact, we were supposed to be in Albania and Montenegro again uh, 
in May, but of course the trip was canceled. But where, what's your next, when we can go, what's your next adventure, Chris? Um, so after I did this trip, I decided I wanted to see the rest of the European countries, which there weren't a lot of at this point. So I'd done other trips before. So my last trip, which I'm so glad I went on in late December, January, was to the Balkan countries, uh, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. But I'm thinking uh, next, um, it, I was going to go to Iceland in May. So Iceland probably is on my list to go to. And I'm also really curious about Russia. And I really want to take the train between St. Petersburg and Moscow. And then there's a very large lake in Russia that I'd like to visit. Um, so that, and then also Kazakhstan. Um, I'm really interested in right now as well. Um, they have a lot of wild horses there. And it's just supposed to be this beautiful, like, untouched country. Um, so that, those are probably the top of my list. But it might be a little while, Betty, before I travel internationally. Again. Very nice presentation. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, okay, we've got uh, a couple, we have two more questions here, and then um, we're, it's 8.30, so why don't we take the last two questions, I think they'll be quick, and then, um, and then we'll go ahead and end the uh, formal meeting, but we'll stick around until 9 o'clock if anyone wants to chat. Um, yeah, Brian, I'll, I'll be here, I'll stick around for a little bit, I plan until 9 in case you Oh, to okay. Um, Bert had a question, uh, do you use electronic payments like Venmo or Cash or in Europe, or Euros, in Euros? Yeah, cash. Um, I actually use those in San Francisco, but when I was in Europe, I would typically just get cash. So I opened up a new bank account too. Uh, this is a shout out to Tony at First Republic because they don't charge ATM fees anywhere in the world. But I was trying to be really careful with that because even now I have like a whole desk full of change in currencies I don't even remember anymore. So I guess that's like my travel souvenir. Um, so I don't use that. Um, I did use a credit card sometimes as well when I could just to try to reduce getting cash out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Tony, I think you had a, something to say. I was going to ask Chris, I can ask it after the meeting's over, but we want to cover uh, the rest of the month for July presentations as well before we close. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, um, why don't we go ahead and do that now and then we'll close out the formal meeting okay. and uh, you know, go ahead, Tony. Great. We have a, Phenomenal month of speakers. A lot thanks to Patricia Fripp uh, for referrals for a couple. So if you do have referrals, please send those on for us. Next week, July 8th, we have Tim Durkin, a member of the NSA and a professional speaker who is going to be speaking about with winning in mind, talking about his mental management program. It is a dynamite presentation according to Patricia, she's heard it, she knows what this is. And you know, from what I've read about Tim, it sounds like it's gonna be dynamite. So you need to be here for that. On July 15th, my friend and one of my coaches, Kamanzi Constable will be on speaking with us. He's, a, he's got uh, five books that he's written, sold over uh, many millions of copies. He also is a, an expert in using content marketing and pitching to large publications to help you build your business and your brand and get on uh, programs or publications like Entrepreneur, uh, Addicted to Success. Uh, he's now a Forbes contributor. So all he's got clients that have uh, gone on to be included in many of these publications. He'll actually be showing us how to do that, how to do the pitches and things like that. So it's a definite go to there again he's a good friend of mine as well and uh, on july 22nd gil sanborn he is the uh and i forgot the title but he's the uh, with the united states army representative for something but i'll get that but he's speaking on russian information warfare it's an excellent topic for today in the news we're always talking about the russians these days uh especially over the last week uh and then 729 Another great uh, referral by Patricia Fripp, Krister Ungerbach, a former CEO or, or technology executive, probably CIO or CTO, but he has a great program called the Talk Shift Movement that he will be sharing with us. Again, it's a program Patricia has heard and recommends highly, so we are looking forward to that. So we have a fantastic speaking program in July, so make sure you invite all your friends 
uh, neighbors, countrymen, you know, just have everybody show up from anywhere. So uh, it's going to be a great month. Uh, I would like to tell my frippets, if they don't attend the next month, they are off the mail list. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I had yeah, one other thing on my presentation I wanted to share, which I think is important. This trip was not expensive, so my budget was 8000 I ended up spending 7200 on the entire trip, and $1,500 was just for opera tickets at Byroy. So that was $5,700 if I didn't do the Byroy Opera experience. So you don't have to spend a lot of money to have a really magical time. Well, Christopher, thank you for joining us this morning and for your story. That was amazing. <laughs> All right, and for those of you that want to stick around and Christopher can answer a few more questions, we'll, uh, we'll keep the room open.